Hey Ruganath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archive classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from Super Soul Farm, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York, the Stubadas. Welcome to the show, everybody. Welcome to Super Soul Farm Wisdom of the Sages Retreat. We're here with 30 plus people, our, uh, our retreat members, Kostuba and Mara here. Mara still, we, we, we made, made Mara sit in the back seat today because she's there's just no room up here. I was going to put her on my lap, but that was a little pr- inappropriate, we felt. Um, it would have would have been another wisdom of sages first, where the speaker had yeah. second. Oh, Lord Shiva also had Sati on her, his lap, right? Yeah. Okay. Or I don't think Sati or Parvati. Parvati. Okay. Well, we're not gonna we're not gonna do that. Um, <laughs> to be imitated. Yes. But it it's good to be here with cursing of a great soul, actually. That led. To, we'll get there. Okay. Later. But I'm here, happy to be with Kostuba, snuggling up against him. Yeah. We did a sauna today together. No, we didn't. <laughs> well, I invited him into the sauna. I do my morning sauna. I said, I said I'm I, going in there. It's a tiny little sauna. Too. No, it's, a, it's a two-seater. It's a two-seater. <laughs> two-seater. You get in there, hold a little pinky, a little pinky, talk about Krishna together, read the Krishna book to him. Not happening. <laughs> anyway, we're excited for this weekend. It's a little chilly, a little nippier than I thought it was going to be. But you know what? Welcome. That's just what it is. We're dealing with it. Yeah. yeah. It goes so good to have a lot of these. You know, a lot of the people here are from Zoom. And if you want to join us on Zoom, you can. You just email Miss Mara, wisdom the sages 108 at gmail.com. She'll give you the secret link, the codes to enter into the secret chamber. Um, but it's interesting to see people you don't really see in person, but you see them on Zoom every day. And like in person, you, I, you know what I want to do to them? I just want to go up and put my hand on their face. Like, yep, you're, they're a 3D person here. Martin is real. Hey, Martin, Ari's here. You know, it's actually so confusing because we're with everybody every day online. There are people that I've met in person that I think I've only met online. And there are people that I've only met online that I think I've met in person. It just it's gets, it gets tough. Look at stuff. This is our struggle we're going through right now. It's very, very tough for us. Um, okay, so uh, what do you want to do first? You got any announcements, Miss Mara? Hey, did you see Miss Mara's line of scarves in the gift shop? Yep. It's a good name. Shravanam. Shravanam means hearing, and sh- every time she's hearing, she's knitting it into the scarf. Isn't it interesting? Interest. Very interesting, Mara. Yeah, um, <laughs> announcements we're back to your cover group meeting at noon today and tomorrow for our Patreon members. Josh Kane is offering an asana class at 10 30 a.m. All righty, pa- another announcement. Another announcement. That last night, Roganath uh spoke at, when we kind of opened things up for the retreat and he spoke about the rescue of Gajendra and that was um recorded and uploaded on Patreon for all Patreon members. Hmm. Want to be a Patreon member? You can be. Thanks for everybody that is. It really means a lot. It uh, encourages us to keep doing this because it takes a lot of time to do this every day when I don't want to do it. <laughs> and I love doing it. But there are days, I, you know, I'm being honest, just so there's days I, like, I don't want to do it today. 
I don't want to do it today. And then you see all these faces that are relying on you. And it makes us, uh, it's good accountability for me. I need that type of accountability in my life. Um, and if you miss the show, I want you to know that I'm going to be upset. Okay. Give me your phone number. I'll text. I should see a group text. Where are you? What are you doing? Why are you on the podcast now? Um, anyway, that it's good accountability. If you want to be a patron member, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. And if you're doing it already, thank you very much. It's appreciated. Double it. Double it. You ready? Okay, here's our nugget today. This is from Aldous Huxley. He wrote Brave New World. Okay. And actually, I have a quote here f from him, a different quote. Or not a quote. Yeah, a quote from him, but this is in today's nugget. But this is him on Bhagavad Gita. Okay. The Bhagavad Gita, this is Aldous Huxley. He said this. The Bhagavad Gita, I think he even did a translation of it or something like that. You know what? I think he might have. I think he might have done a translation of the Gita. He did something like that. So he says, the Bhagavad Gita is the most systematic statement of spiritual evolution of endowing value to mankind. It is one of the most clear and comprehensive summaries of the perennial philosophy ever revealed. Hence, its enduring value is subject not only to India, but to all of humanity. Aldous Huxley. Can I squirrel out for a second here? Check this out. So I've been... Uh... Trying to be very broad minded. I've been following a lot of like Christians on um, Instagram. OK, just how, how broad minded. Of you. Well, I'm just well, no, I'm just trying to like, you know, expose myself to other th because we accept that, you know, every every different spiritual paths on a path to spirit. And, you know, we're trying. I'm, so I'm listening to it to appreciate but the I, I've got three of them in the last three days demonizing yoga. I think they're you're following the wrong ones. <laughs> <laughs> I think I am too. They're like yoga, and they're like, here we have a yoga teacher who's recovering from, you know, she taught for how many years? She's like, I taught for five years, and and it's all like, you know, you know, basically you're trying to um, connect with. They call them gods, but they're actually demons. And I was like, wow, this is really <laughs> off base. <laughs> Anyway, I was trying to tie it to all together. Okay, back to Aldous Huxley. Hit it. You read the nugget. Okay, here's the nugget. Ready? There are things known and there are things unknown. And in between are the doors of perception. It sounds like uh, the Twilight Zone opening or something yeah. like that. When do, you, when do you comment on that, sir? Well... Of course, he was reading. Obviously, he's reading Bhagavad Gita. I'm sure he's reading Upanishads, you know, things like that. And um, he says there are things that are known and the things that are unknown. A lot of times when you're reading Srila Prabhupada's books, he, he uses two words that are and he He uses them in a bit of an archaic way. I even looked it up today. Like a lot of times Srila Prabhupada speaks about gross and subtle. Right. Yeah. Subtle, not so archaic, but but gross. The word gross. He uses the word gross all the time. Is that archaic? I was. I always say it like Prabhupada says, but maybe I stole it from Prabhupada. Because usually when I grew up saying gross, like that's gross. Yeah, the modern use of the word gross is usually like disgusting. Yeah. Whereas, and even it said it's archaic right here in the thing, saying archaic. Gross, meaning immediately obvious. Okay. Right. Now there's, a, there's another word, crude, right? Which could also be used the way that Prabhupada uses gross, but both of these are crude, the, the the archaic definition of crude is like lacking a covering, glossing or concealing element. Oh, like someone's. Uh, I don't know. How would you like say a, a crude a, statement? A, a cr okay. We no, when we be... when we hear crude statement, we think it's a statement that's vulgar. B right, but it's not. It's just like. Um... Well, that's the modern usage of it. But right. it could mean a crude statement could mean like a straightforward statement. Okay. Where you're not gotcha. concealing anything. You're. Gotcha. There's, no hidden, there's no hidden meaning behind it. Yeah, so you're gross and cr and and cr <laughs> and crude, but in the archaic way. <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes today, I'm going to say you're crude and gross, and you're like, which way are you saying that? <laughs> so, so, okay, so so and like when Prabhupada says he'll often say like the gross body, right? That As mean you're that's not body shaming. He's not saying your body is gross. Right. He's saying he's speaking about the, the physical body as and even when we say physical, you see, that doesn't quite do it because we, we accept that even the mind is made of 
physical material energy but but so he'll say the gross body and the subtle body referring to the what we could say the physical body or the the mind which is a very subtle body right so so gross things it's hard to find just the right english word for it. tangible maybe mm. you know something that that's um that's easily perceivable and so, there, so when Aldous Huxley says this, um, there are things that are known and there are things that are unknown. There's things that are gross. There are things that are subtle, right? There's things that anybody could pick up and perceive quite easily. And then there are things that are like beyond that, that are real things, real, real truths mm. that we may not, that some people are perceiving and some people may not be perceiving that are more subtle. And what's between us perceiving those subtle things is what he's calling the doors of perception, right? Like there, there are, there, there are, there's something that lies between us and, and our perceiving reality mm. for the full reality. And he's calling them doors. It, it, it may be even a better metaphor would be like um, lenses, mm. right? And then it's a question of like, kind of like cleaning those, those lenses one imagine if like, like let's say it was something like uh you know how they have those eye tests with all those letters yeah and imagine like you had to read it but there were like a, a series of lenses between you and what you're trying to perceive clearly hmm. and there was a method for like cleaning each one as each one gets cleaned you're kind of like getting closer to your perception of it or let's say it wasn't like those letters but it was like a, some kind of image and as each one's being cleansed you're getting a it's a better picture a better picture you're, you're coming closer and closer to understanding what it is and then finally when they're all clear you can fully perceive it and so what is what are those doors of perception like what 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 do we mean when we say perception and i had a uh, I, I found i don't even know where i found this but it said but this was interesting i thought it said perception is the combination of your thoughts, beliefs, opinions, and awareness, hmm. right? So a lot of how our mind has been molded through our conditioning in life, how we were raised, who we associated with, and, and what we talk about on the show a lot, like um, what we consume, right? Even, food, entertainment, education, association, all of these things that are entering through our senses, they're creating, um, Filters. Filter, yeah, you could say filters that that are that that are altering our perception. You know, a, a good point here is uh, our behaviors, and as well as our external behaviors, but how, how we're also processing things create those blocks as well. You know, if I'm a little arrogant, well, if I'm a little arrogant and self-absorbed, I'm not going to see things through your point of view. I think he could say he could have added attitudes to that, right? Your thoughts, your beliefs, your opinions, your attitudes. Yeah, and they, and they and they shut us down. That's when we, yesterday we we started our program with our six pillars. You know, I'm tolerant. I'm you know I will not criticize. All of that is just to help your vision. Is to help yes, you yes, see yes, the world exactly. because if I'm a little compassionate, I have to like enter into your emotions. I have to be a little bit more empathetic. And the beautiful thing is when Krishna sees, because Krishna is real. Krishna is not just like a cartoon or a statue, whatever you call your uh, the divine energy or source. You're being noticed, your behavior and your choices are being noticed. And if you want illusion, if you want to be and what's the biggest illusion? I'm the center of the universe. That's the very opposite of reality. Interesting you, you went there because that's where the, the direction of our show will be going. Interesting. Sometimes. <laughs> so when you want that illusion, Krishna's, Krishna will back off. And then his, his energy of Maya will come in. And then if you say, you know what, I'm actually going to go north on the fork. I'm not going to go south on that fork on the road. I want light. I want truth. I want love. I want Krishna. I want to see myself as part of something bigger. Then Krishna steps in. And it's... And Krishna is actually cleaning the lens. He's removing. Krishna is actually giving the vision. That's that's what the, the famous. That's when Sri Chaitanya composes eight verses. He started Chaito, Dharpa, and Marjan. He began to describe it's like through this meditation on these names, which are pure spiritual energy, the 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 dust you know on those lenses begins to become cleansed. That was my meditation while chanting. 
in the sauna today. <laughs> it was like, these are keys. The holy name is a key. It's a key to enter like some type of vault. You know, it's it's a key for vision. It's a key for vision. And it's what's inside the vault ultimately too. Right? And yeah. it's what, yeah. But it, 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 it it's- It's it, a means and the end. It's a means and the ends, but, and it's, it's, the intention of how I'm chanting it as well. That's what makes it. It's not just sort of like rattling it off. I did it. I rattled off these particular sound vibrations, but there's an intention and a mood of the heart wall in the process of doing Japa meditation. This is great because you see, we're going to, as we've been mentioning uh, throughout this week and a little bit last week, we're going through a section of the Bible where we're going to be summarizing parts of it. Mm. The next chapter we're about to get in is like, it's like a, it gives a long list of measurements, you know, different, different. It's even hard to describe exactly what they are. They're not exactly planets, but they're like planes of existence. Yeah. It's in, in the universe in outer space, right? Well, first of all, measurements, like who's got a monopoly on measurements? Like why are we using, you know, one yard? And well, I mean, we obviously Americans have their own unique system of measurement. And then uh, the rest of the world has another one. We refuse to learn it. Um, but, you know, if you trace back early, I'm looking at Mara. Mara, you probably know. You know, they used to do like, what are some old school measurements? Anyone know? Cubits? Is that a... Acres and they, uh, bushels, hands, a peck, a peck, a peck of peppers. <laughs> no, there was other, a cha they'd have a chain. And the chain, and there's like something about the chains together would make one. Uh, I should have. It's okay. Yeah. You anyway, got the point. you got the point. And like, and that's the way one part of the world measured. And I'm sure every culture had their own version of measurement. And then finally, we settled on a global type of measurement. But the Vedas do it also. And in the same way, we have like uh, seasons. And in tropical countries, they have like six seasons, right? But if you extract and pull and zoom your way out, um, which the Vedas do all the time, they talk about sort of like the seasons of the demigod, so to speak, or the seasons of the universe. And the, the time cycles are so much larger, like these concentric circles. We're talking about the, the lifeline of a fly. What do they, they live for two, two weeks or three days sometimes? Then you have the lifeline of a, 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 you know, a tortoise that lives for a couple hundred years. It's a different lifeline, right? Or the lifeline of the planetary systems. You know, so the Vedas talk about these measurements and timelines in such massive zoomed out ways. It can almost seem like fantastic. Yeah, it, they use the term uh, measurement called the Yojana a lot in, yes, in the Bible. The it's about four Yojanas away. Or, or they say like 100,000 Yojanas. It, and a Yojana is, is uh, they, the, the astronomers, they say it's about like eight miles, about eight miles. Yeah, sometimes measurements, but usually they go with about eight. I know because my kids to drive them to school is like four yojanas away. <laughs> That's what I told the teacher, and they're like, "What?" But in any case, there, there's there's going to be a list of measurements. Then there's there's also a description of the heavens and what it's like up there. It gets into that. Maybe we can summarize a little bit about that. And the hells, but not in this chapter. You know, it's interesting. I think I could relate. Sounds to like a squirrel coming. In. <laughs> no, I'm thinking I could relate to those Christians. Let's talk about hell. Come on, we're on the same page. Come on, we believe in demons too. <laughs> yeah, find find your find where you. Uh, They're like share. Don't accept you. Shared interest there. Hell. Okay. I think we should find out what we have in common, you guys. So anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna hear this description of the universe. But the question is like, why are we hearing this description of the universe? Why all these measurements? What are we getting into? And we're gonna hear a verse about why it's important, and it's gonna have to do with perception. Mm. When when we look at this world, how do we perceive it? Two people can be looking at this world and perceiving it in two very different ways. There's a way. There's a way to kind of cleanse your lenses or adjust your lenses, or even. Um, I mean, that's really obvious when you people sometimes people come up state and they're like this is so beautiful and then other people i was like welcome and they're like there's so many bugs here aren't there there's so many bugs <laughs> or, or even like like someone attends like a a program that we're doing or let's say a yoga class right like one guy walks in the yoga class and says oh this is so nice you know it's peaceful and it feels good and 
and, and I'm, I'm feeling my awareness, you know, becoming more clear. And other guys look around, oh, this is a you great must... place to pick up girls here. You know, it's like it, according to your your attitudes and your yeah. desires, and, and you you see it in a different way. I actually had where was I? I just came back. I was just came back from like a pilgrimage, and I was like, I had the most incredible. I can't remember, but I was just like flying high from a pilgrimage, and a guy came up to me and just goes, "Oh, you had one a pilgrimage? That's cool." He was like, I heard it's a great way to meet women at pilgrimages. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I've never once thought I've of ne- that way. <laughs> I've seen hundreds of them. <laughs> never, ever. I was like, I can't believe it just came out of your mouth. <laughs> but it's it, it's a different lens. And sometimes that's the lens. I'm looking for a part. It doesn't even have to be like, it could be a, a, innocent. I'm looking for a partner, maybe on a pilgrimage. or, or But I, his wasn't like that. His was like, I heard there's a lot of <laughs> yoga women on these pilgrimages. <laughs> but, you know, so it, you might have the lens of lust or the lens of the, the lens of greed, right? You know, look at this beautiful forest. You know, you people, some people could think, well, I could slap up a condo right there too. That would be pretty good too. So you're thinking, yeah. So yeah, what lens are we wearing? That's a great sign. And we're asked to wear this lens of divinity where we're seeing God in everything. It's That's where it's going to go, Raghunath. Right That's where it's going to go. <laughs> okay. But, you know, I also, I, I wanted to spend a little, th- we're going to stretch out this nugget because you were mentioning it in terms of like meditation on the, on these mantras, you know, like trying to, trying to approach it with the right attitude or the right, you know, it, our perce- our per- you see that again, the idea is that our mind has been conditioned and due to that, we've accepted all kinds of things that aren't true. Like the, the, the very conception, this is me, this body is me. We, we perceive it that way. And it's, it's really illusory. It's, it's, it's almost silly. And if you, and if you draw your perception back just a little bit and you can, and if we were able to see like a course of many lifetimes, we would understand I'm definitely not that body. I just passed through for a moment. Um, so, so when, we have so many misconceptions like that and what's presented in these texts is that by bringing your mind and deeply absorbing your mind in certain manifestations of spiritual energy and i know that that can sound vague but these will go into more detail but if you can absorb your mind into these mantras for instance Mm -hmm. then the your true nature arises your spiritual by bringing your by filtering that through your mind it adjusts your lens of perception, and, but it requires the right attitudes. So when you sit down to meditate, you, you, the right conceptions, the right sentiments, the right attitudes, the right lifestyle practices all help kind of clear those lenses of perception so that the, that energy really comes through. And I was, I, I mentioned yesterday that uh, two nights ago, I spent at the Bhakti Center with Sachin Anamaraj, who's coming up here today. Yeah. And he was basically his whole program is like, hey, we sit and we do kirtan together all the time, but let's just try to adjust those lenses of perception so that we, so that we connect with it more, so that we benefit from it more. And he read a little something from his book, which we read from yesterday, um, called The Living Name. Mm. And I thought I would read that. And, and you ready? Yeah. And this is three things that he mentioned to to think of, to, to bring your mind to, to bring your awareness to um, as you're sitting down to get into kirtan or you could say chanting japa, right? Ready? He says, okay. He says, at first he said, take a few deep breaths, bring your awareness to, to each inhale and exhale. Doing it. I'm just, you read. I'm no, just no, no, no. I just it. want to get your breath. Oh. <laughs> You ever do this one? You go to a doctor and the doctor says, chanting. Just- you go to a doctor and they're doing the stethoscope and there's like, okay, take a deep breath. And if you're like a yoga student, you're like, Ooh. <laughs> and the doctor is like, all right, okay, it's good. Uh, you can exhale now. <laughs> all right. Okay. So he's, but he's talking about bringing your awareness to your breath because it's, it, it settles the mind, right? It says, continue to breathe consciously in this way until your mind. <laughs> <coughs> Wrong pipe. Until you're, you're going to be okay? Okay. Continue to breathe this way continuously uh, until your mind becomes calm and focused. If distracting thoughts uh, or feelings arise, gently let them go and then, and then return to your breathing. 
Okay. Then he says, when you feel centered, calm, and focused, envision in your mind's eye these truths. Okay. This is what's going to open up the doors of perception. Number one, I am, right? The conception of who I am. Right? I am an atomic particle of consciousness and Krishna's eternal servant. Right? That's the first point. And he gives a little, he, he fluffs that out a little bit. I am categorically different from the body and mind. And, and when he spoke this, he, he added a little, I'm reading from his book, but he added, I, I'm categorically different from the body and the mind and all the thoughts that are passing through the mind. Right? I am a tiny soul. I am an eternal, blissful spiritual being. I am part of Krishna. Okay, that's the first. Second, Krishna is the infinite conscious entity and my only master. And he adds to that, for so long I have invested in so many relationships, but now I understand that Krishna is my only master and my only true friend. Okay. And then he says, the material world is a house of shade. <laughs> it's kind of like that. I was thinking, we were thinking, we were going on there talking, I said, you know, we, because we have the house of pain here, Brittany Payne. And we said, actually, another nickname for her could be Durga. Durga. Because Durga means like fort, and it also means it, it, like difficulty or struggle, you know, pain. In a sense, you know, Durga. We speak of this material world as Durga. It basically means it's a house of pain. What did House of Pain do again? What song? There, what was there? Jump Around. <laughs> that is a very Krishna conscious song, right? You jump Around. Is it? No. Well, it Jump Around is. You could think of your hands in the air, jump around, jump up, jump up, and get down. Yeah. <laughs> they go up, they come down. <laughs> Just blew a hole in that theory of yours. <laughs> okay. No, actually, now that I think of the lyrics, no. No. Okay. Okay. Sometimes there's these songs that you're like, this is a Krishna conscious song. You just got to replace her name or his name with Krishna. And it's like totally works straight over. That one is not. That one <laughs> does not. Because I just went through some of the lyrics in my head, slapping the girl. You know. Stay away from that one. <laughs> okay. Next point. Let's uh, bring it back here. So the material world is a house of correction, he says. House of correction. It mm -hmm. is. That's a great analogy for the material world. We're just getting corrected. We're just getting corrected from poor behavior and poor thinking patterns, and, and which we bring in. I brought my bad thinking patterns that I've trained myself in in this life just due to my family, due to my high school and junior high school. I trained myself in bad thinking patterns. And now I'm going to take those bad thinking patterns, patterns and come into a sacred circle and make tons of offenses. And that's and and now I have to start to undo them, so I get a little a little correction. Yeah, actually, Vaishesh group sometimes even on our show. Do you remember what he said about correction? I live for correction. I live to be corrected. I live to be corrected. Oh, because I wrote a little list of things I want to correct you about. I'll share it with you private later. <laughs> no, you're supposed to use it for yourself. Oh, you, you can't use it for you can't use it for everybody I, that, else. That's, that's I live that's, to correct that's, others. That's, a that, that's the material world. I live to correct you. I, I'm really bad at seeing my own shortcomings, but I can really help you with yours. So 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 and I like the way that kind of the context we just brought up, because when I heard him speak of it, I always thought of it like I live to be corrected, like. Be open to people correcting you. But you could also think of it in a broader sense, like I exist in this. My purpose in this world is to be corrected or to be reformed or to yeah. or we could say in a, in a softer way to grow. Right. We say it like that. Evolve. Evolve to grow. OK, so so his third thing, first of one was, again, I'm atomic particle of consciousness and Krishna's eternal servant. Krishna is the infinite conscious entity and my only master. And then find even the word master. Right. It's like when we hear that now, it's, it's like, like archaic. We don't. It's also, yeah, master is a horrible word. It just means that it's the one that cares for you, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, the idea. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> it's like it, it's just like it, it was there was always the idea of a, an apprentice and a master. You're le learning uh, to be a goldsmith or a coppersmith or uh, a, a music teacher. You call them the maestro. That's what the maestro is. He's the master. That's the master is a good thing. Or like even a pet and a master, right? The master really cares and provides for the pet. Yeah. So 
Krishna is the infinite conscious entity, my only master. And then finally, the material world is a house of correction meant to reform my tendency. Now, this is key. You ready? This is saying this is a one. It's like the whole purpose of our existence in one sentence here. The material world is a house of correction meant to reform my tendency to remain absent in our relationship. Right? I'm absent in my relationship with Krishna. Mm. The, the material world is a house of correction meant to reform my tendency to remain absent in that relationship. That is a great way to look at it, isn't it? Yeah, then you chant. Right? Mm. Now you've opened up the doors of perception. So so what, what these texts are and what we study every day is it's saying like, there are yogic masters that were perceiving things that we're not perceiving. They're going to help us open up the doors perception that we can see it. It's going to require, it will help tremendously with the right lifestyle. A more mm. sattvic lifestyle is going to help, right? Mm. It, it, the right um, attitudes are going to help, you know, humility, kindness, you know, simplicity, things like this. Um, and you, the right conceptions, you're going to need to have the right conceptions. And, and you keep looking through those lenses and those those attitudes, those sentiments, those um, conceptions are going to begin to clear those doors, those lenses, or open those doors of perception, and then you can actually see truth, like the, the whole truth, the real truth, the big truth that that from our tiny little perspective we're not picking up on. It's not a gong that's going to go off, although sometimes that happens and it appears like now I'm realized. But they're they're little increments of gongs. They're little gongs. Ding. They're little bells, and you're like. Oh, I, I, I see this differently now. I see the because I can definitely say like my visions changed from when I first started practicing bhakti in a maha way. <clears throat> but um, it, it's not like we're just dull and all of a sudden we're enlightened. That's what I think people want. They want like a some pill, something a, a cheap a self-realization pill. And it makes them very prone to a lot of these bogus so-called gurus and so on who are kind of like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I can give you that. I'll teach you that. The higher around pretending that they've got it. The higher teachings. Hmm. I can help you. All right. So you ready to get it? Yes. Yes. Narayanam namaskitya naram chayva narotamam devim saraswatim vyasam tatojayam mudirayat. Before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is our very means of conquest, one should offer respectful obeisances to the Supreme Lord Narayan. Unto Narayan Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, unto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and to Srila Vyasadeva, the author. Nasta prayesha badresu nityam bhagavat sevaya bhagavati uttama sloke bhaktir bhavati naishtiki. By regular attendance and classes in the Bhagavatam and by rendering service to the pure devotees, all that is troublesome to the heart will become eradicated and, and loving service to the Supreme Lord whose praise with transcendental songs will be established as an irrevocable fact. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Salakaya Chaksurun Madatam Yena Tasmai Shri Gadave Namaha I was born in the darkness of ignorance and my teachers are opening my eyes with a torchlight of knowledge. I offer my obeisances at their lotus feet. Reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 5, Chapter 15, text. Well, Oh, Chapter 16. Entitled? Entitled, A Description of Jambu Dweep. It's quite exciting. It's like, what's a, what's a Jambu Dweep? Dweep is like an island, right? Yeah. But so the, so, sometimes, so, like, Bhagavatam refers to, like, planets as islands. Mm. Or, again, I think this is more like planetary systems that we're talking about here. You know, I've heard it from a, a devotee scientist explain, you know, sometimes when we do astrology, we're looking up at the celestial bodies, but the Bhagavatam gives um, the vantage point of looking down upon the universe. And therefore you see looking down on creation and the only explanation I can find. Maybe Karen Carpenter was a demigod. But anyway, and so if you look at it like that, it almost looks like, you know, you're like, imagine seeing the top of a planet. They look like little islands. Mm? Yes. Interesting. Yes. Right. Wouldn't that vantage point look like island? See, there's different vantage points of 
three hundred. Uh, yes, of our, there's different vantage points of this Super Soul Farm. I could be sitting under the desk, and that is a reality. You could say I'm at Super Soul Farm, but you're actually under the desk. So how much do you actually perceive of Super Soul? Very little, right? But you can think, no, I'm here. I'm here. It says it's. Uh, it says here on my maps app that I'm here. But this is all our vision. So we can think of ourselves also like these little bugs with bug-like vision that we think we're can, we, if I'm sitting under the desk, I can't even begin to understand the celestial bodies. So we can think of ourselves like bugs trying to speculate about the universe. We're bugs, we're, we're covered. And it's not just gross coverings out there that are stopping us from having divine vision. It's gross coverings in here. There's people, who have what's called the yogis would have what's called Deva Darshana. Have you ever heard of that? Deva Darshana. It means even though they're here, they can perceive higher beings that might just be walking in the room. They're walking out of the room or something like that. Exciting. Right? It's exciting. It's very exciting. But there's layers of we were. This is exactly what we're talking about. We're living under a desk. That's a takeaway for today. We are bugs. We're bugs. We're living under a desk. <laughs> okay. How about that? That's a t-shirt. Wisma Sages. So, so We're bugs. So, um, what podcast do you listen to now? It's a bug pod. It's an insect podcast. <laughs> All right. So, Earth cantos ago, we were hearing about the material world. I'm sweating. Many cantos ago, we we're hearing about the material world and we're in, in, in giving a vision of a way that we can look at it, even though it is the quote unquote gro gross material world, right? The tangible, physical, material world, that if we see it in the right way, it begins to open the doors to perception. Mm. And so here, um, Maharaj Parikit in this chapter is going to ask Sukadeva Goswami, could you describe the universe for me? You've, you've mentioned some things about it. I want to know about it in detail. Okay, and then, then we get this text three, and I want you to read that, Radha Maharaj. When the mind is fixed on the supreme personality of Godhead in his external feature, made up of the three gunas, or the three modes of material nature, the gross universal form, uh, the, gross, uh, the gross universal form, it is brought to the platform of pure goodness. Let me read that again, because... The mind is brought to the platform of pure goodness. Okay, when the mind is fixed upon the personality of Godhead and his external feature made up of the material modes of nature, the gross universal form, it is brought to the platform of pure goodness. So in other words, if I see this world disconnected from its source, it draws me deeper into illusion. But if I look at the same world and in my mind, I'm connecting it to its source, it's opening up the doors of perception. Got a good analogy here. Um, I remember I used to teach yoga in Beverly Hills and, uh, I remember eating myself some, what's that? That's some hillbilly. Bill, Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> no one knows that reference, Kostuba. We're, we're old. <laughs> now the Europeans don't know the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> it was like a very, it was a classic. It was a, but anyway, um, depending on what guna you're in goodness, passion, or ignorance, you perceive the world in different ways. And I'll tell you why. I was coming out of one of the classes I was teaching in Beverly Hills, and I was just shoving a holistic dark chocolate, 90% cacao chocolate bar in my mouth. Just like, and one of my students put their hand on my shoulder. She goes, do you know what I do for a living? I said, what? She goes, I'm a chocolate taster. I was like, I didn't even know that was a job. She's like, yeah, I get flown all around all over the world to taste chocolate. She goes, you're totally eating that wrong. I was like, tell me, master, how do you eat chocolate? <laughs> and she told me, I can't remember now, but there's a there's like a precise way. Like you put it on your tongue and then you suck it and then you move it to different parts of your mouth. And I was like, I've just been shoving this in my mouth. And let's face it. You can take a tiny piece of chocolate. I do this sometimes with students during teacher training to have them understand the difference between goodness, uh, goodness, passion, and ignorance. Because you could eat a piece of chocolate like, like this and swallow it and swallow it so quick you don't even taste it, right? 
or you could take a tiny piece and just that could last you like five or 10 minutes. So there's actually more pleasure and there's more subtleties. You taste the subtleties when you're doing things in a subtle way or in a sattvic way. If we bring I our interest to the cut to Raghunath eating that chocolate, what you saw. <laughs> oh, let's go back in time. And here's a picture of Raghunath eating that chocolate walking out of Beverly Hills Sports Club. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I think, well, just because I got it at Whole Foods, it must be healthy. No, you got to eat it in a healthy way or it doesn't count, Raghunath. <laughs> I don't I, didn't, I think that uh, that premise just doesn't cut across the board that just because you bought it at Whole Foods. No, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Regardless of how you eat it, there's plenty in there that's not. Oh, good. yeah, there's plenty in there that's not healthy. There's like carcasses in there, but but. Grass fed carcasses. OK, but okay. you are. So you're saying so that. My, you know, uh, an so, yeah. So as we raise our consciousness to sattva, which is basically the entire yoga system, whatever lineage of yoga you follow, it's to bring the consciousness to sattva. Your your perception of the universe changes. It become become very lucid. So here it's saying when the mind is fixed on the personality of Godhead, which is above the gunas, right? Then this external, uh, all the gunas, uh, the, the gross universal form, it's brought to a platform of pure goodness. And it, here, here's the next section. In that transcendental position, one can understand the personality of Godhead, Vasudev, who is the subtler form. Uh, who, who in a subtler form is self-effulgent and beyond the gunas. Oh, my Lord, please describe vividly how that form, which covers the entire universe, is perceived. So when he says that form, he means the universe. Right. So he's again. So he's saying here that if when I look at the universe, even these measurements and, you know, he's given sizes of planets and distances between and even it's getting into mountains with these enormous measurements and trees with enormous saying that this is this is what this is what he created right and and if i'm thinking of that connected to him then that's bringing my mind to the platform what he calls pure goodness this suda sattva this even a, a type of thing that's beyond the modes of material nature and when you perceive the gross world in that way it opens your mind to perceiving the subtle that that's the you could say that is the gross form of god this universe it's in a metaphorically it's his body when i'm looking at it i can be looking at him in a sense right mm -hmm. but when you so when you practice seeing this world through through that lens then it opens up your doors to perception to perceive that subtle form which we're not perceiving at all right now which is i can perceive this world so let me adjust how I see this world, and then I'll be able to perceive what's beyond this world. Nice. It's not just sattvic living that gives you that uh, divya chakshus, that divine vision. And you've got to be led there. You know, we, we have teachers, there's, there's masters, teachers, instructions, how to be led to see. Otherwise, because the downside of sattvaguna or mode of goodness is you get a little, you get a little proud, and then it, it locks you in to a material vision you're yeah you're not taking drugs you know you're very regulated you wake up early your garden's perfect your lawn is your your lawn is great but you're a little arrogant and, and you look down at people you're like oh how could she do drugs why did she get that tattoo why you're right you, you got you're or even you just get so comfortable that you lose your drive to to take it to the next level that's the downside of satvaguna It'd be nice if we were all sattva guna, but it can also get. So this term suda sattva, although literally means pure sattva, it's actually indicating something beyond, something that's not of the three modes of material nature. Which the Bhagavad Gita again and again speaks about. Here's a little bit of the purport. Maharaj Prickett had already been advised by his guru, Sukadev Goswami, to think of the universal form of the Lord. Yeah, so that was back in the second canto. That means God is everything, right? Yeah, this, this world. Right. Uh, and therefore, the, following the advice of his guru, he continuously thought of that form. The universal form is certainly material, but because everything is an expansion of the energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, ultimately nothing is material. Hmm? Interesting. Therefore, 
Prickit Maharaj's mind was saturated with spiritual consciousness. Um, it is said by Rupa Goswami, there's a quote, everything, even that which is material, is connected with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, everything should be engaged in the service of the Lord. Um, let's just stop there for a second, because that's a great one. So this microphone is material, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Fuck yes. <laughs> me! Trick question, because Stuba led you to the wrong answer. It's actually spiritual because ultimately it's coming from God. And therefore, if it's re-engaged, if matter is re-engaged in the service of divinity, it actually becomes a spiritual microphone, right? If I'm using a harmonium, which you think, well, it's a pretty spiritual thing. But if you're using it for, if I'm using my harmonium, so I, I, I want people to think I'm such a spiritual person and a grounded person and it's really all about my my kirtan's all about my ego then i'm taking the this chanting box whatever it is and i'm using it for my ego so therefore i'm keeping the material matter in the material world so our job is sort of uh we're connectors of things of this material world and we're spiritualizing them because ultimately god everything comes from god our bodies come from god and therefore, if we use our body, if we use our voice, if we use our thoughts, if we use our talents in service of divine, then our whole being becomes divine. And what we're trying to do is get 100%, not just 4% or 1% or 20%. In this lifetime, we're trying, can I turn up the needle so that every thought, every, you know what's great? I woke up and someone was saying to me in my dream going, Oh my God, Raghunath, that's a Krishna miracle. And I woke up to that. That's how I woke up this morning. So when we are 100% God conscious, light conscious, truth conscious, Krishna conscious, Christ conscious, whatever you want to call it, then even when you're sleeping, when it's, you know, it's understood that's Tamagoon. You're out of control there. You're floating around. The, your, your thoughts are getting crystallized in spirit as well. Right. And, and the words that are coming out of your mouth on a regular basis are uplifting and connected thoughts, your activities, your joys, your passions, your recreations. That's when we are fully God conscious. So we're all sort of God conscious. We wouldn't be at this retreat if we were, you know, uh, not into something a little, even a little. So we're just trying to, like, see where that needle is and saying, well, it feels good to turn that needle up a little bit. Right. You, you, you know, there's kind of a theme to the whole chapter and into a lot of what's going to be conveyed in these last chapters of the fifth canto. That, it, again, it's it's changing your attitude, changing, your, opening up the doors of perception, changing how you perceive things. And and, you, and most fundamentally, like when we read those those um, statements by Sachinandan Swami, it, it kind of got to the essence. You know, most fundamentally, when I wake up, and I look at this world, what, what do I perceive it as? And I might perceive it as it's a place for me to try to enjoy, right? It's a place for me to try to find some pleasures. It's, it's kind of like the default attitude. You know, right. it, 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 I, I feel better when I'm, when I'm experiencing pleasure. And there are things here that provide pleasure. There's a lot that's not unpleasant, but let me try to find as much pleasure as possible and avoid the unpleasant. That's my mm -hmm. strategy. That could be one way that you approach it. Another way you can approach it is, no, it's, it's actually not meant that for my pleasure at all. As a matter of fact, it's not my property. I didn't create it. I didn't design it. I'm just dropped in the middle of it. I'm assuming that it's my, I'm assuming that this body is mine. Even my body's not mine. Not only am I not this body, this body is not even mine in one sense, right? Um, and whatever there Such is, it's an interesting concept. It's not my body. This is where the deep thinkers go, right? Yeah. The, the, the real sadhus, they're thinking that way. Even this body's not mine. It's, yeah, it's I didn't, it's, it. it's on loan to me. I can't yeah. keep it. I, I didn't create it. It's just, I'm just like, I'm responsible for it. Uh, yeah. I have some responsibility because yeah. it's sort of in my, in my care yeah. for a few years. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so it's kind of training us to shift that attitude from a, this world is meant for me to enjoy. Well, if it's not that, then what is it? Oh, it's it's where I'm meant to. We could we could say it's where I'm meant to grow, right? It's it's where I'm meant to 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 find the truth. It's it's meant to reform me. It's it's meant to. Again, you can you could kind of you could kind of phrase it 
in a heavier way, like it's meant for my correction, you know, or you could say in a softer way, it's meant for my growth. Both truly, yeah. however you want to put it. It's meant for my growth. It's a prison house. It's a prison <laughs> house. It's reform school. Reform school. Reform school. That's a good way to look at it. It's like reform school. Although it wasn't mayor, wasn't at one time reform school like a good thing, like. Like, like where you'd send like a, a you become a lady or a gentleman. What, what was that called? Finishing school. Thank you. Finishing school. I'll finish you up. Well, that's, that's, You're a little crude. That's that's kind of like what what we're looking at. Like if we were able to look at our life like, like several lifetimes, then it might be like. You know, you're making some. There's something I don't even know if I should share it here. No, no, that there, means, yeah, as long as it doesn't involve biting someone's finger off like yesterday. No, it, it involves spoilers. Because um, a friend of ours wrote a drama and I saw it. And it was so good. And he asked me to write a um, Yadunath. Oh, OK. So Yadunath is our friend. He's like a professional um, improvisational comedian. Yeah. But he also does serious drama and he wrote a play. I saw it. It was like an off Broadway play. I saw it. It was brilliant. And it um, played with it played with concepts like the plausibility of reincarnation and karma. And he did it in such a clever way. Um, I would love to talk about it, but I know that if it'll ruin it for everybody, okay. if they you're right. Yeah. But we'll uh, get them, when, it, when it comes out or whatever, we'll get them on the show. We can talk about it. Yeah, but it involved this idea. Well, we won't even be able to do it then because it'll spoil it for. <laughs> but uh, but but it involved this idea of like through becoming refined through many lifetimes. Right. So like uh, and it's total squirrel. Mara came up to the computer to get the closing song ready, but she's on her knees. And I thought it was a little girl. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, it was unnecessary. <laughs> we don't need all of your thoughts, just some of them. <laughs> okay, so in any case, you know, this this lifetime for us could be our finishing school, right? It's like yeah. the, the last where we get our final yeah. polishing, right? Like let's let's learn all like our life. We spoke about uh Indrajumna Maharaj who became an elephant. And that elephant was finishing school for him. Or we talk about Bart Maharaj, who was a deer, and then he became Judd Bart. That was finishing school. And you imagine looking around this room like, who is it? Who here? Like, this is it. They just they got a couple big the couple big lessons. If they could just finish them off in this lifetime. It can be each and every he, one of us. It could be everybody. Or be none of us. <laughs> it could be Gus. Gus. <laughs> it could be Gus is like, uh, this is it. It's my last life. So I lick I lick the feet of the devotees. What more do they want from me? It's like I I, I have no material desires left. Just look at him down there. I have no. Ma- <laughs> you you got to look at this dog right now. He's so incredibly. <laughs> but in any case, oh. you know, to wrap it up. Uh, so so after he asked this, he's told about these measurements, these planets, these th- these heavenly places where. It describes the heavens where where um, people are living these super long lives. And, and I'll just read just a, a couple little things about the, the, the description. I'll just what, a couple what, of these verses. Saying? Descriptions of rather than just all the measurements and so on, that gives a little description of the lifestyle of the rich and famous. OK, so but this is in higher, higher planes of existence. It's not it's not the spiritual world. These are just higher planets of the material realm. It's describing that it has these lakes and these massive fruits and 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 and, um, even like it's saying that there are these massive mangoes, they fall, they crash and and, and the juice from the mangoes goes into the I don't know if earth is the right word, but it goes into the land and then that land turns like into like a a type of gold and the residents are all wearing this this gold. You know, it has these. Why not? Why, Why not? not? It's possible. He says, um, the celestial beings such as the Siddhas, Charnas, and Gandharvas, these are all like beings that have incredible talents and and long lifetimes and beauty. They um they're also known as the devas. They enjoy the facilities of those lakes. Okay, okay, okay. Listen, 
if you hear this, we're we're running out of time here. But but uh, my squirrels. no no no, it's not a squirrel, sir. Because here this is, is when here's how I read the Bhagavatam. When I read the Bhagavatam, I read it in two ways. One is like, okay, I've been into this for a while. I'm getting into it. Then I listen to it with an other set of ears, which is like, I'm brand new to this. What the hell are they talking about? But we know in this lifetime, in this country, if all you grew up with is a in a ghetto where they're everything or in a country where it's covered in trash or in you know, parts of America that are covered in trash. And then all of a sudden there's people that have a massive lake on their property, on their property or a massive, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, massive home or beautiful forest or some no, breathtaking who lives like that. Right. If you live in city, you know, my, my, my brother owns a building in New York city. It's got a lawn the size of like smaller than my living room. And he's like, look at my lawn. <laughs> I was like, I'm not impressed, <laughs> but <laughs> he actually bought a lawnmower. I was like, are you kidding me? No, I need it. I need it. Cause sometimes this gets high. And um, so anyway, my point is that when you're living in a ghetto, it's hard to imagine an estate. You're saying we're so we're living in a ghetto. And when we hear these stories of higher planets, why couldn't they exist? We're living under a desk in a ghetto. And these are subtle, subtle places of uh, existence. That's called an open mind. Right? Yeah, it's, okay. it's trying to be a little critical okay. thinking here. Thank you. Uh, consequently, um, they have the natural perfections of mystic yoga, like even living in that atmosphere, drinking that water, swimming in those lakes, is, it's giving them these powers, uh, such as the power to become smaller than the smallest or greater than the greatest. There are, there are also four celestial gardens named Nandana, Chaicharata, Vibrajaka, and Sarva Lobhadra. Nanda, Nanda, Nandana, Nandana Garden is this. This is Indra's planet. He's got. He's famous. He, and we're always bragging. Yeah, have you been to the botanical gardens yet? Yeah. It's nothing. Nothing. New York botanical gardens compared to Indra's planet. The best of the demigods, along with their wives, who are like ornaments of heavenly beauty, meet together and enjoy within those gardens, while their glories are sung by lesser demigods known as Gandharvas. Right. I mean, but even then, like, I think when we hear that, our mind is considered like, why do those lesser ones have to sit there and sing songs about that? Because they love them, right? And they, and they admire them, and, you know, and, and, they, and from their heart, like, they want to glorify them. I want to go back them. to this. I want to I talk about heavens more tomorrow. Well, let me just read a couple more. Things. All right, it's past seven, sir. You okay. keep interrupting me. That's I, would, I had it timed, you know? Okay, then 24 and tw 25. It's called a podcast. <laughs> we go back and forth. I know. <laughs> Similarly, on the, Kum on the Kumuda mountain, there is a great banyan tree, which is called Satavalsa, because it has 100 main branches. From those branches come many roots from which many rivers are flowing. These rivers flow down to the top of the mountains and to the northern side of Ilavrta Varsha for the benefit of those who live there. Because of these flowing rivers, all the people have ample supplies of milk, yogurt, honey, ghee, molasses, food grains, clothes, bedding, sitting places, and ornaments. Well, we also get those things because of the rivers, too. Oh, yeah, rivers, yeah, grow things. All of, the, all of the objects they desire are sufficiently supplied for their prosperity, and therefore they are very happy. The residents of the material world who enjoy those products of these flowing rivers have no wrinkles on their bodies and no gray hair. Oh my God. They never feel fatigue. And perspiration does not give their bodies bad odor. <laughs> they are not afflicted by old age. I have to take a shower after the podcast. You know that? <laughs> They're not afflicted by old age, disease, or untimely death, and they do not suffer from chilly cold or scorching heat. Nor right. this, I want to peel this whole thing apart tomorrow. I think it's very interesting to just, I don't want to just cru cruise over this. They don't get old. That's, isn't that interesting? They just they don't and they don't have untimely death. But they do die. They do die, but it's not untimely. It's like, okay, I'm gonna go. Bye. It's not like a motorcycle accident or something like that. It's, okay. Miss Mara, please welcome back to the show here, Miss Mara. How are you? Got some good takeaways for us? I do. I got a lot of good stuff. Clean your we are but ah, that was no, the last, last one. one. It's not the last one. Clean your lenses to perceive clearly. 
Uh -huh. What we consume creates our filters. Yes. The holy name is the key and the treasure. Oh, that was nice. <laughs> that was Kostuba. I said the key. You said the treasure. No, no not really. I I treasure. I was oh, thinking like. Yeah. 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 Okay. You, you get credit for that one. <laughs> Wear the lens of divinity. Wear the lens of divinity. Like a pair of glasses. Yeah. Okay. We're bugs living under a desk in a ghetto. That's a t-shirt right there. That's a t-shirt. This world is our finishing school. Yeah. Uh, hopefully. And be gross and crude in an archaic way. Oh, yeah. That was a good takeaway. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here at our Wisdom of the Sages retreat. Woo!